Welcome to Love You a Brunch, the podcast for foodies and those who'd rather be brunching. Hi, I'm Jody Stapler. We are speaking with Nandita Gadbole today. She is the author of 10,000 Tongues, Secrets of a Layered Kitchen, a novel, and it has a companion cookbook called 10,000 Tongues, the Companion Cookbook. I am so excited to be talking to you today. How are you doing? Hi, Jody. I'm very good. Um, thank you for having me share some parts of my books and stories with you. Absolutely. Now, I do have both of the books. Um, 10,000 Tongues is a novel that's based on eight women. Now, are these women from your actual family or? Yes, they are. The stories are based on women that um, that lived, um, obviously, before me. But there were so many gaps in some of the, their life stories that I couldn't really put them down as as a biography or, you know, a family memoir or anything like that. So I took representations of their life and how they lived and the, took the key points of that and shaped um, the minor narratives around them. But more important, it was more important to me to uh, recognize their place in the culinary narrative of my family and the dishes that they brought because of who they were and the lives they lived and where they lived. So um, it became a, uh, a food novel. Right. And it starts back in like, um, like 1899. Is that right? Uh, yeah, it actually goes a little further back. Um, I picked it up at 1899 and somewhere, but um, India was going through um, a pretty big turmoil with, uh, they were struggling, with, the country was struggling with uh, the British rule. There was famines and uh, unrest in general, and it did affect the lives of uh, the farmers. Um, people were... Um, running from one place to um, find uh, safety and security somewhere else. Uh, some of them were being forced into work for the British Army uh, or for the company. Uh, and it became a very tumultuous time when the country was trying to find its, uh, its place and its voice. And um, it, knowing that I had some family stories that came from that time allowed me to explore that time frame from a food writer's perspective about what would have happened. Um, and I discovered there were narratives about the famine and how it affected certain uh, food-growing regions. It allowed me to explore that a little bit. Um, and that's where we started there. Um, and it goes through the gamut of uh, different communities and how they handled um, the transition of um, being under a foreign rule to being a country that was independent. So if you're into history or want to know more about how the India of today progressed throughout the years to become what it is, this is a great read. But what makes it even more special is that there's the companion cookbook that you can actually cook the same recipes that they're making in the story along with the book as you're reading it. Yeah, I thought that was a very necessary bit because I started writing this uh, book. Um, the original intent was to just collect family recipes and, um, uh, you know, what did grandma make or what, you know, what did great-grandfather love or, you know, we, I started doing the research based on that premise. And the more I discovered uh, the backstories with the recipes, there was a greater need for me to put the context in place. And so um, that became part of the journey of doing the research and writing about the context. And um, I was just reading this morning uh, someplace, and I've long believed that, um, and this is, I think, all your listeners will agree as well, um, our food does not exist in isolation. Our dishes don't exist by themselves. There are people and places that it is those foods are connected to whether it is from the simple thing of a farmer or where it comes from or who makes it and what they bring uh, so understanding the complex pieces of any dish became important so they kind of go together uh, because to me the recipes 
if I just give you a recipe and say, go make it, you may not understand why this, why that dish, even though it appears really, really simple, why it holds a lot of meaning to me or has a value to a particular family or its place in the, in the family history. So to make that connection, they kind of go, both go together. Right. Now, I love cooking old family recipes and historic recipes. I collect old historic cookbooks, and I like to try them out. But how special that is to really think about that, that you're making something that someone from your family may have been the first recipe that the wife made for her husband. Like, what a cool connection that is. Yes. Yes, um, there are many, many stories about the first time somebody made something for their spouse or for a loved one or for um, and as an honorific dish to um, recognize uh, visiting someone or meeting somebody for the first time. And uh, it's funny, we have several stories from, from different people about what that, that first dish was that they made and um, almost invariably those dishes didn't succeed the first time. It shows a growth for that person to develop an interest in and in building that connection to the person they were cooking for with that dish. And um, we don't think about it often. We just look at uh, successes and failures and we don't uh, often think about why uh, someone would be able to perfect a particular dish uh, or why something is very uh, uniquely theirs. And there is that backstory that goes with it. Um, for instance, my mom, whose character is represented as Shaku, um, she was raised in a family that didn't eat meat. And um, her husband, uh, the person who's represented, who my dad's character represents, uh, he loved meat. And so the first time she had to cook for him, she had to figure out and find for herself why she wanted to cook meat for her husband. And then dealing with the process of, of trying to process the meat and how traumatic that can be and what, what her way out was from that point. And it was the most hilarious story I had heard um, about my mom uh, tackling a, a piece of chicken. You know, I thought to myself, how how is it that we don't recognize these funny stories? They do sit, stick out in our memory when, you know, we think about the weird ways we show love and affection and care for our family members. Right. I I so relate to that. Um, I I'm sure I've mentioned it on the podcast before, but my family my husband and my children and I, we were all vegetarian for 16 and a half years. And um, long story short, I started craving meat when I was pregnant with my youngest child, my daughter. And I, I guess we've been meat eaters for maybe nine years now. And it is still difficult for me to cook meat. But that first time that I had to make chicken... Um, I'm lucky that I had Facebook because, like, I was on there asking everybody, like, what do I do with this white stringy stuff? Do I cut it off? Do I cook it? What do I do? Yeah. So, like, I understand what it's like as someone who never cooked meat before as an adult to have to do that. So, yeah, that was really a great place in the book. So, tell us some of the recipes that are in your book. And in did they come directly are they exactly like your family members would have made them or were they passed down that way or have you changed them over the years um our recipes are typically very orally transmitted so it's hard to have them written down somewhere uh it all depends on what that person remembers whether you know a certain item was not available in the grocery store and they swapped it out for something else and what I realized when I was talking to a few people that everybody remembered the same dish slightly differently. And whether it was, oh, cardamom was added, oh, cardamom was not added. You know, it was like minor <laughs> yeah. stuff like that. But it does affect the quality uh, or the taste, rather, of what you made. So I took 
you know, larger structures of how a recipe kind of came together. I looked at what uh, we what would have been common in that time frame for for that particular family member and kind of extrapolated from that. However, I'll also say those recipes weren't rocket science. They were very simple at best. Um, there were probably about three or four recipes that have more than eight ingredients in it. So mm. your your range of uh, error is very small. So I would right. say that maybe there might have been a way a different way somebody may have prepped an ingredient before it went into the dish or how it was served. But I'd like to think that they are closer to how they would have been made as opposed to the exact yeah. replica of those things. Now, right. on the, as it got closer to um, my generation and when I cook, those are literally how my recipes are written. Um, Anna is one of the characters uh, towards the end, and her character is based off of um, things that happened to me. And yeah. those are the things that I cook regardless of time or day uh, you know that's pretty much how much how we cook them uh right the same goes for shaku's character her recipes are pretty close to what she would make now we have to make some adjustments some things are not available in this time and age or in this kitchen so you kind of go oh line item you know this would have been used but swap it out for something else Right. So, Plus, the um, kitchens would have been, you know, now are you, you're you have access to so many things where um, a lot of places, even still today in India, are still cooking over an open fire. Yeah, of course. And um, some of the things that um, that are that are still happening, even uh, my mom lives out in the countryside, and much of her staff and um, around her is um, she has she has a small property, so she has staff and. Um, her staff will cook on open flame and will bring in a lot of the rustic uh, cuisine or the, the foods from that region to her yeah. house. So sometimes when we're eating them, my mom will have adapted a recipe that one of uh, her day maids brings to, you know, hey, um, mom, I thought you would like this. And then she kind of goes from there and adapts it. So we have kind of a little bit of an in on some of those techniques and the ways. But at the end of the day, except for a few cooking um, techniques where an open flame cooking will, dish will, or rather a dish that's cooked on the open flame will taste different than one that's cooked, you know, in a pot right. um, indoors. Except for those, the tastes kind of remain the same. And if you think about it, um, the indoor cooking process, it's, it, you know, the rural areas still have a lot of... Um, in the in the extremely poor areas, the people are still cooking on open flame using you know um, kindling and whatnot. But then, st gas stoves or stoves are not uncommon. So yeah. I don't see that as a huge distinction where it affects the end result in right. some ways. Um, right. Yeah, you're going to not have the smoked you know aroma in every dish that's made from the 1800s because that's what right. was going on <laughs> then. Um, yeah. But if you want that authentic thing, you can actually add that flavor in. Yeah, that's and, true. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are ways to add little droplets of things. Or um, there's a chef I know who adds a smoked flavor to some of his dishes by literally taking a piece of charcoal uh, and keeping it in a container inside the dish when it's finished and let that flavor infuse. Um, right. So he doesn't, he doesn't even add anything into the dish itself. Um, so we can do a lot of that, but the point was to preserve and showcase some of those flavors and tastes that, uh, honestly, to to this day, we still cook about 98% of those dishes that are mentioned in the cookbook. Yeah, uh, I so love it's that. Very, yeah, it's very interesting to me to see that we kind of cover uh, about 150 plus years of just family history, just without thinking about it right what a great thing to pass down to uh you you're you have a daughter right so yes, what a great thing to pass down to your daughter and then other families that maybe didn't keep records of the recipes that maybe they can share with their families as well and of course wonderful for people who just love indian food that mm -hmm. don't get the authentic thing um because even restaurants today aren't exactly authentic so 
Mm-hmm. It's it's an awesome, awesome way to to have access to that. Of course. And then that's part of um, my goal has been to um, kind of keep some of those little treasures in place. And um, my my daughter is a teenager, so heaven knows when she really will be interested. I mean, we didn't know right. when we were teenagers when we <laughs> exactly. were interested in in things. But yeah. um, my goal is to even even for myself, I too am exploring and um, and learning about my own culture. And um, actually, for the past couple of times that I have been to India, we go once every couple of years over what is India, uh, what is our summer here in in um, in the U.S. And I will go and travel regions and and learn about um, learn about the cuisines that are local to that place and. I'm actually going to start taking people with me to join me when I'm in India to, you know, just come on these little excursions and um, come with me to, we can explore food together, which is what an experience, important thing for me, but I think it'll be so invaluable when, you know, I'm sharing this with other people and we might have completely different experiences than if I were to go alone or they were to go. Alone. Right. So I'm looking forward to doing some of that this summer. Yeah. Now, are you going to be like, is it going to be like a tour type of thing where people can uh, pay to come with you? Or are you yeah. just taking? Oh, that's awesome. So where would they be able yeah. to find that? Uh, they can email me um, currycravings at gmail dot com, and that's my email address for any and all things that related to to my work. And or they can find me on social media and just ping me um, as the dates get closer um, to the summer. I will know specific dates when I'm traveling, and then we can start looking at uh, specific windows of time. Yeah, because technically um, our summer essentially begins with um, anywhere from the end of May through about uh, early September. And I'm going to be in India for about uh, eight weeks out of that giant wow. chunk of time. So for me, I'm, I'm planning workshops, writing workshops in India. Um, I'm planning for workshops that happen at my house at, on the farm where it's like hands-on stuff. Uh, we're planning to travel a couple different places, but all of those details have to be kind of pinned down based on how many people are interested in a certain sector. So we're looking at yeah, absolutely um, the 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 Jaipur or Jaipur sector sector, which I really okay. really love. Um, yeah. And I think you've been to that area yes. as well. Yes, we so. visited uh, Jaipur for a, a a couple days to look at the temples, uh, but we mm-hmm. stayed in Jodhpur. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I've been, you know, Rajasthan was my favorite place to go, but that is the best way to travel, especially in India, is to to find someone that knows the area that is either a local mm-hmm. or like you, you have a home there. So, you know, yeah. the family's there. Yeah, so, I, I mean, uh, for Jaipur, I have an extended uh, relative who lives in there, but um, I've been often enough where we can navigate around where you're you're not spending the time kind of just wandering, but you're making a very direct and, um, uh, you know, deliberate attempt to go see certain places or do certain yeah. things that otherwise would not be, or it would be too much on a tourist calendar. You know, right. you don't want to be exhausted, but you want to enjoy every piece of your visit. So Absolutely. I want to take people um, to, uh, to Jaipur, Daipur, and, um, also, as part of that, then we explore some of the regions that are talked about in 10,000 Tongues because some part of it is story is written in that region. Mm-hmm. And essentially, this summer, the trip is going to or the trips are going to be to those regions that are talked about in the book. That's awesome. So we will be yeah. going to uh, Kolhapur uh, and uh, it's a family deity. So we will be going to the temple or at least I have fervent hopes of going there. Um, going to Jaipur in uh, in the Rajasthan area. I have family in New Delhi, so we go to New Delhi. So there's like go to Pune. So a couple of different places. If we get our if we get our act together, I would love to take people to the tea estates, mm. and um, that's a whole different experience uh, to go to the tea estates because you never really think about how beautiful and how calm and peaceful and how 
interesting that tea culture really is. Right. Um, you 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 walk out with a whole different appreciation for just your ordinary black tea. I'm not even right. talking about any of the other stuff. Yeah. But there are lots of cool places to visit and see, and I would love to take people out uh, with me where we learn about the food and the people and, you know, you do a little sightseeing. It's, so, it's kind of a little mix of everything where you come out actually having enjoyed your visit rather than just running through everything. So. Oh, absolutely. That's, I think that's why, I've, like, I, I think I've mentioned it before on here that India was my first time out of, basically out of North America. And uh -huh. um, it was such, we had, it wasn't a tourist trip, really, because mm -hmm. we, we um, hired people that were locals to take us around mm -hmm. and show us, mm -hmm. like, the businesses. And, and they brought us back, and his wife uh, made us a meal on the open fire. And mm -hmm. it was such a different experience than when we've gone to Europe and you're just the mm -hmm. tourist. It's just... yeah. It's so it's so much more special. Yeah, and um, you know, it's one. It's a great way to explore a culture, um, and especially if you're interested in the foods. Um, it's really, it's really a much richer experience when you uh, when you travel to a place and you see how connected the food that you really enjoy, how connected that is to the community and to the culture that's around. And India Absolutely. is such a complex culture in some ways, and I think every every uh, you know major civilization or every civilization or every region has that that depth of um, of interconnectedness. And for India, people are more often afraid because it's so it can be overwhelming. And I you know sometimes it overwhelms us, and yeah, right. we're from that culture. So yeah. um, I wouldn't be surprised if it does that to other people as well. But to right. see how food really shapes how things work yeah. um, brings a much greater appreciation for even the simple stuff. Uh, and I'll share this anecdote. Um, uh, I used to host dinner parties at our house. Mm. And uh, for one of our secret suppers, um, I had decided to prepare rotis. Um, it's one of our very traditional Indian bread. It's uh, it's loka roti, which essentially is partially cooked on the griddle, and then it's cooked on the open flame. I have a gas um, stove, so it works really well on that. And uh, it's one of those things that it's individually prepared. Like, everyone is meticulously dealt with. So if I make a stack of, of 30, every, every one out of those 30 is individually handled. And mm. I would see people load up their plates and whatnot and just kind of enjoy it. And then there were families who um, didn't understand that it actually took a lot of work to do individual pieces and they were getting individual pieces that had been managed individually. So they would load up their plates and if they never got to it, they would toss it. Oh. And, and it was like, it was heartbreaking to see them toss yes. something that had you know, it literally takes about a minute and a half to do about two minutes, depending on how big the, the roti is, for it to go through from being a ball of dough to being something that you can eat. Um, and I had to stop them and let them know that this wasn't just a, something that was prepared in a pot that you could, you know, take servings and yeah. pieces off of if you wanted a piece. That's how much work went into it. And so uh, what I find often when it comes to foods that people don't know about is they don't understand the context of what of what happens or what it takes to prepare that item and bring it to your table. And understanding that brings a greater respect. And when I shared this backstory of, you know, okay, let me show you how it's made. And I went through that. And the family was, Unfortunately for them, they were really embarrassed, and I, I, yeah. I didn't want to embarrass them. But now I know that that them and their kids and anybody they talk to, when they go to eat Indian food, they're actually treating it with a lot of respect and right. not wasting, not creating waste. So, um, you know, those kinds of things that I really want people to understand that a dish doesn't just suddenly appear on your table. It takes time for it to be prepared. It's made a certain way, and you know, that's what you would do in your own home as well. So absolutely. Yeah. 
And one thing about your cookbook is that you do have a bunch of fried um, breads like this, mm -hmm. flatbreads like roti mm -hmm. and um, naan and things like that. And mm -hmm. there's nothing better than freshly made breads like that. Um, things you buy at the store cannot even compare. No, they can't compare. And um, in fact, there was so much of a demand for uh, understanding how different breads are made. And uh, I'm glad you touched upon this because we're coming out with a new book. Um, probably it's releasing at the end of next month. Um, that's only... We were having some horrible times with our technology this day, and I do want to apologize, but Nandita and I did get cut off at this point, and we could not get back connected. So I apologize to you as the listeners, and I apologize to Nandita, and appreciate the patience that she had with all of our issues today. But I do want to mention the book that she was about to say is Roti, Easy Indian Breads and Sides, the second edition. So go out and get that and learn how to make your own breads. And also make sure you pick up Town Thousand Tongues, Secrets of a Layered Kitchen, as well as its companion cookbook, because the stories are awesome. The recipes are even better. And make sure you visit currycravings.com. I want to thank Nandita Gadbole today for joining me and sharing with me her story of 10,000 Tongues, Secrets of a Layered Kitchen, as well as the companion cookbook, 10,000 Tongues, the companion cookbook. I also want to thank you for joining me today. Please make sure if you like our podcast to subscribe wherever you're listening and join us on our Facebook page, Instagram, and Twitter. And share us with your family and friends. If you have any suggestions, feel free to leave a comment or email me at loveyouabrunchpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much again. I'm Jody Stapler, and join us next week on Love You A Brunch.